My name's Regan. I work for Anthony J. Lyon, Detective Bureau. They call me the Lion's Eye. Sunday at 8.30 and CBS brings you Jeff Regan, Investigator, starring Frank Graham as Regan with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. So stand by for mystery and suspense and adventure in tonight's transcribed story, The British Are Coming. The neckties were all labeled LG for Lord Granger. Only Granger wasn't a lord, and the Fallards tied us neatly into a case of champagne suppers, an Narcissus complex, and a man who wanted people around when he committed murder. I just finished a double-decked hamburger and two cups of coffee at a Beverly Boulevard drive-in, so I was feeling pretty good when I checked in with my boss, the Lion, at the detective bureau. Jeffrey, my boy. The Lion was holding up and admiring what I thought was a cow's tongue. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. What is that? A uh, uh, necktie, my boy. A uh, Lord Granger original. Uh, this necktie is number three. You uh, see, it's marked. <laughs> There's only one of its kind in the world. Maybe because only one guy in the world would wear it. <laughs> I take it you're not familiar with Lord Granger. You take wrong. The Lord Granger chain of English-type men's clothing stores... Uh, haberdashers. ...clothing stores is owned and operated by Kirk Granger. Uh, Kirk Granger, an extremely well-dressed man, but he's in great danger, Jeffrey. Oh, so Granger's a new client. Eh? Yes. He gives out these original ties as calling cards. You see, his initial is woven in at the bottom. What's uh, Granger's trouble, Fatso? Well, you see, he's going to kill a man and... Uh, uh, he's going to what? Well, I'm sure that's what he said. And Mr. Granger wants someone present at the shooting as a witness to prove it was self-defense. You accepted a case like that? Well, this is a big case, Jeffrey. Here's his check for $500. Here, here, there's another 500 in it if you're present when the shooting takes place. A witness to murder. <coughs> of course, the only reason I accepted the case, Jeffrey, was in hopes you might prevent the shooting. Well, who's gunning for Granger? Some young man, but you'll have to get the details from Mr. Granger. Don't worry, I will. I left the lion tying a Windsor knot in his red and purple Lord Granger cravat. The lion had already tied us into a case as phony as padded shoulders, but maybe he was right. If Kirk Granger was going to commit murder, maybe we could stop it. <laughs> Headquarters for the Lord Granger chain of shops was in Beverly Hills, just off the main drag. Aloof and very British, with a roll of tweed and abrasive bagpipes in the front display window. Inside the shop, it smelled of fine woolens and leather. I asked a doddering clerk with crumpets on his breath where I might find the offices. He finally managed... Uh, I saw ...and pointed toward an elevator so conservative it was almost invisible. On the second floor, I asked an office girl wearing black watch plaid where I might find Cook Granger. Being fitted, don't you know? I didn't, but uh, he was. I found Kirk Granger in the fitting room. He was about 47... Smartly gray at the temples with a swimming pool face and the large body of a softened athlete. Surrounded by mirrors and a tailor with pins in his mouth. Please stand firm, Mr. Granger. Sir. Haven't you finished with that cummerbund? I'm attempting to stick it in, sir. Well, stand behind me. I can't see myself in the mirror. Yes, sir. Now that's got it. Oh, you're Regan. I answer to that, Granger. And well, I've seen your picture in the tabloids. That's why I called on your agent. That's what I want to talk to you about. Why you called our detective bureau? Uh, you may leave us now, Fielding. Uh, but we hadn't started fitting the trousers, Later, sir. Later, Fielding. Yes, sir. Quite right, sir. As you say, sir. You, uh... You want to talk standing here in these mirrors? Uh, yes. You see, standing here in this one position, I can see both my sides, my front, and my back. Well, as good a reason as any. Uh, would you stand to one side, please? Uh, oh, oh, sure. Uh, you were blocking the light. Now, to business. That's what I had in mind. You see, Mr. Regan, I'm going to kill a man. Uh, just like that? Yes. And as I told the lion... Oh, I say, they call you the lion's eye, don't they? Very amusing. And gets laughs at parties. Well, there's only one thing I need to make my killing complete. That is? A witness to testify that I shot in self-defense. You see, I have no desire to go to the gas chamber. That's plausible. Is there any particular evening you're free, Mr. Regan? I want to kill the man at... Your convenience. Oh, decent of you. Well, not at all. It's just that I wouldn't want you to break off a date or anything like that. Uh, who is this lucky fellow you're going to kill? Have you, have you told him about it, or is it going to be a surprise? <laughs> oh, 
course I haven't told him. Mm -hmm. Maybe he won't be able to keep your appointment. No, oh, he'll keep it all right. Any time I'm ready. Mm. You mind my uh, asking the prospective victim's name? James Benson. He manages my shop in the Medical Mile. Uh huh. You um, you won't mind if I have a chat with Benson? Oh, of course not. But when he's dead, you're liable to feel a little sentimental about it. Huh? He's a very nice boy, a little high-strung, perhaps, and you're liable to become emotionally involved. I'll risk it. Then I'll call you when I'm ready for the kill. Uh, one thing, Granger. Um, you obviously have money. Pots. So you're killing Benson because of a woman? Of course. Her name is... Lynn Richards. Oh, look, Mr. Egan. What is it? When the light falls on my head at this angle, don't I remind you of Walter Pigeon? <laughs> Kirk Granger was lost in a well-tailored world all his own. I didn't want to break the spell or Granger, so I walked out toward the clear light of the street. Number one on my list of persons to see was Lynn Richards, the woman in the case. But before I made the front door, Fielding, the little tailor, grabbed at my sleeve with thumb and forefinger. You're Mr. Regan of the Anthony J. Lyon Detective Bureau. That is completely me. We all know that Mr. Granger has hired you. Oh, do you now? We Why? Have, we have our suspicions that it is to protect the person of Mr. Granger act as his uh, bodyguard, as it were. I'm sorry, but I can't discuss a client's business, Fielding. Mr. Regan, listen, as a craftsman, a tailor, I know that Mr. Granger sometimes uses local tweeds and has British labels sewn in them. His character is of the very worst. What's your point, Fielding? If anyone does serious harm to Mr. Granger, would you note details so that we, the members of his staff, might recount them at our picnic the day of his funeral. I uh, couldn't promise anything, but I said I'd keep an open mind. Then I asked Fielding if he knew Lynn Richards. He did. Lynn Richards was an employee of Kirk Granger, stationed right on the premises. In fact, right upstairs. She was the girl I'd met wearing the black watch plaid. Back upstairs, I introduced myself to Lynn Richards, who in turn invited me out to tea. I accepted graciously, and we walked across the street to a small tea room. Would you care for a biscuit, Mr. Regan? I'm sorry, Miss Richards, but uh, there's no time. I want to talk to you about Kirk Granger. Yes, we all know why you're here. Ah, Lord Granger has an informed staff. Oh, I just like talking about my employer, Mr. Regan, but if I were to say he is something of a cad, I... I shouldn't be far from the point. Actually, he's been very nice to me. But uh, you've seen how he treats other people? Yes. Like maybe Jimmy Benson? I suppose Mr. Granger hired you to watch me. Perhaps to keep Jimmy Benson away from me. Perhaps even frighten him away. Do you uh, hate Granger? No. I don't hate him. I don't love him. I'm capable of no feeling whatsoever where Kirk Granger is concerned. Jimmy loves you. Yes. And Kirk Granger doesn't like it. As a matter of fact, Jimmy and I have been, well, sort of unofficially engaged to be married for, well, for quite some time. But you can't make up your mind. Oh, I want to marry Jimmy. If, if only he could get over his, his stupid jealousy. Well, sometimes jealousy's justified. Oh, no. Jimmy shouldn't be jealous. He has no right to be. Oh, anymore. But he did at one time? A year ago, before I'd met Jimmy, I had dinner a few times with Mr. Granger. You don't see Granger after hours anymore, do you? Oh, no. Okay, Lynn. That's all I need. Well, where are you going now? To talk to Jimmy Benson before he makes his last appointment. I got Benson's home address from Lynn. I waited until he had a chance to get home from work, maybe six o'clock, then I went to his place. It was a trim, boxy boarding house in the older stretch of Wilshire Boulevard. Front door was locked. I rang. The woman that opened the door looked like a landlady. She had a mop in her right hand, a jailer's ring of keys at her belt, while with her left hand she attempted to push her sliding hair straight on her head. Uh, you want a room? I'm looking for... That's nice. We're famous for our home-cooked meals. I, uh... Come in. Uh, is there you a... You look like the kind of people we like here. What's your name? Jeff Regan. That's real interesting. Uh, how much money do you make? Uh, oh, odd amounts. Uh, now, let me see... Where shall I put uh, Look, you? lady. Uh, just call me Mother Cole. All my boarders do. I'm looking for Jimmy Benson. Oh? Uh, is he in some kind of trouble? Where's his room? Uh, 
head of the stairs, first door to the left. Ian? He checked in at 5.43. He was walking more rapidly than usual. Took the stairs two at a time. Thanks, Mother. Uh, let me know what happens. I knocked on Benson's door. He answered. Jimmy Benson was tall, dark. Below his straight black hair was a handsome face, still soft with youth. Now it was strained and intense. What do you want? Uh, talk with you? I don't know you. Would you mind if I come in? My name's Regan, a private investigator. Private investigator? Ah. Nice room you got here. What do you want with me? You're a good friend of Kirk Granger's. No. Why not? He's cheap, low, dirty, no good. You're jealous because he's been seeing a girl, Lynn Richards. What do you know about that? Well, I know that Lynn Richards isn't seeing Granger anymore, after hours. I know that Granger thinks you're going to make a fool of yourself and go gunning for him one of these days. Yes, I've had that in mind for a long time. You've got to kill his kind to make them leave their dirty paws off your girl. That's what he's hoping you'll do, Benson. Come gunning for him. He'll be waiting for you. I told him to his face I'd kill him if he didn't leave Lynn alone. That's no good. Why won't he leave her alone? Look, Benson, you've got to promise me you won't go gunning for Kirk Granger. I... I... I, I, I don't know what to do. Just believe Lynn Richards and keep your head. What? What right have you got telling me what to do? What do you know about it? Benson, it's your life. Okay. Okay, it's my life. Maybe you're right, Regan. I'll call Lynn. Just before I closed Jimmy Benson's door on the way out, I heard him make a dinner date with Lynn Richards for that night. So it looked like everything was going to be fine. But that was before I received a phone call a few hours later, at 9 o'clock. On the other end of the line was Kirk Granger. All right, Regan, tonight's the night. The night for what? I want you to come to my house immediately, Regan. Don't worry, you're safe. You have my home address. I'll expect to see you within 20 minutes. <sighs> okay, Granger, you paid for it. I'll be right out. Hurry. I want you to get here before Jimmy Benson. You think you'll be there tonight? <laughs> I'm almost positive. Well, you can relax, Granger. Benson won't show. But I will. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> Kirk Granger's house was a replica of an English country house, complete to walls hidden in ivy. Ivy that now showed black in the moonlight. There was no doorbell, just a bronze coat of arms that served as a door knocker. I knocked. <coughs> Nothing. I tried the doorknob. The house was locked tight. Everything was dark. And then I noticed a light reflected on the leaves of a tree toward the side of the house. I walked back along the path toward the light. There was an open door leading to a garden. I stepped into the light of the doorway and felt a gun in my ribs. Oh, it's you, Rick. Put the gun away, Granger. <laughs> yes, sir. But you won't mind if I keep it handy? That's your business. When I heard the noise on the path, I thought it might be... Jimmy Benson. Yes. You didn't want to shoot because there'd be no witness. That's right. I was merely going to keep Benson alive until you arrive. Give him a chance to go for his weapon, then kill him. Why don't you forget all this, Granger? Forget Benson. That's not the way I play, Rita. Why do you expect Benson out here tonight? Oh, intuition? Tell you what. My intuition says he won't be here. We'll see. Ah, large room. Windows locked. Yes, I've locked the entire house, with the exception of that door to the garden. We have to have air. Well, it helps. Hmm. This uh, must be your study. Yes, you're observant. Mm-hmm. Hey, you like mirrors. Vanity. Mm. I have them on every door, Regan. Oh, uh, how do you like the drape of this smoking jacket? Very smart. If you don't mind, I'll just sit at this desk. Anything you like. It's going to be a long night. Fine. I'll just lay my revolver here on the desk in front of me. You won't need it, Granger. We'll see. All right. We'll both wait and see. Granger sat at his desk, his back against the wall. The desk lamp lighting his harsh features, and we... Waited, both of us, watching the door that opened to the garden. One thing was sure, Benson wouldn't show, wouldn't be fool enough to. But then we heard a noise outside, like someone running. 
There's a crashing sound through the bushes. It's Benson. Ranger turned and in one swift movement snapped off the lights, all of them, but the one on his desk. Then there was a figure at the door. Granger! Where are you, Granger? Shoot, Benson. Benson, get back! All right, Benson, I've been waiting for this. The room went white and red like heat lightning. I ran for the light switch. But now, it was too late. All right, Regan. You're my witness. He tried to kill me. I fired in self-defense. A man lay on the floor, face down. I turned him over. It was Jimmy Benson. And he was dead. This is CBS, and you are listening to The British Are Coming, tonight's adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator. It started when a man named Granger hired the lion and me to witness a murder. That's right, murder. Only Granger told it another way. He said a kid named Benson was gunning for him, and he was going to gun right back. He wanted us around to make sure it was self-defense. Granger was right. Benson did come gunning, and Granger was waiting for him. And Granger's aim was better. I uh, told that to Police Lieutenant Candid as he stood looking over the body of Benson, munching his usual candy bar. And uh, you, uh, <clears throat> you say you were standing right here when it happened, Regan? That's right. You, you want a bite? No, no thanks. And uh, the dead man, uh, Benson... He came in the French door shooting? He saw Granger and opened up. Granger fired back. Mm, Granger was a lucky man, Regan. Not so lucky. What do you mean by that? He had his gun ready, Candid, real ready. He knew the score. Still, Granger was lucky the boy's shots went so wild. Yeah, maybe you got something. Okay, Regan. <clears throat> What's eating you? Candid, doesn't it seem odd that Granger fired perfect shots in semi-darkness, yet Benson couldn't even hit the right side of the room? <laughs> maybe Granger had been practicing. Maybe it's even better than that. Mm, you sure you'd want to buy the candy bar, Regan? It's your chocolate arm here. Candid okay. munched, and I thought. But it still came to one total. Granger had shot and killed Jimmy Benson in self-defense. I was walking out for fresh air, thinking about that, when I heard him. Oh, uh, Regan! Oh, Granger. I want to talk to you. Police through with you already? Uh, it's an open and shut case, Regan. Thanks for your kind assistance. Leave me out of it. Oh, on the contrary, I couldn't have done without you. You earned the other 500, Regan. You haven't seen the coroner's jury yet. A mere formality? Here. You're eager to be sure, aren't you, Granger? I hired certain services. Those services have been rendered to my satisfaction. Take the money. Suppose I tell you I think your self-defense plea is phony. What you think doesn't matter. What the police think does. Suppose I tell you that somewhere, somehow, I'm going to find out the truth behind tonight, the real truth. You were here. You saw the truth. Something's missing. Leave that to the police. All right, I'm in it now, Granger. More than I thought I'd be. I'll let your money buy too much. Too much what? Too much Regan. From now on, I promise you'll get more than your money's worth. I left the well-dressed Mr. Granger sputtering over his open billfold. It was pat, too pat, too perfect to stomach. And somewhere in it, there was too much planning. If the lion and I had thought we could stop a killing, we were too late. The only thing left? To establish a murder. It was the next afternoon before I got something worth working on. I, I drove down Wilshire to the trim, boxy boarding house where I'd met James Benson. Out on the steps was the person I wanted to see. Mother Cole, sweeping leaves with a battered broom. Yes? Oh, it's you again. Did you decide on that rule? I, uh, I wanted to talk to you about one of your boarders, uh, James Benson. What's that? Jimmy? Oh, is he in trouble again? Benson's dead, Mrs. Cole. Jimmy? Dead? Oh, my, isn't that a shame? So young, too. Well, we all have to go sometime, don't we? Uh, would you like to see that room, Mr. Regan? Room? The one you're interested in. Oh, it's very nice and airy, too. I could give you a special rate. Well, uh... Uh, No, wait. 
Why, you could have Jimmy Benson's room if you liked. It's the best one in the house. Benson? Yeah. Yeah, Benson's room. Maybe I'll take a look at that, Mrs. Cole. I followed the landlady up the stairs to Benson's room. Mrs. Cole unlocked the door and gave me the complete tour. Then she beamed proudly. Well, you take just as much time as you like, Mr. Regan. I'm sure you'll decide on it. And I was in the room alone, looking at the neatness of it. At the studio couch a dead man wouldn't be sleeping on. At the telephone, at the desk still open. And then I found plenty. A date book, dated 1947, but with entries made yesterday, the day before. A date book that had become a diary. I read it, the entries about Granger, about Lynn Richards. Jealousy raging on every page. Until the last entry, yesterday's. And that's the one that made me stop. It said, he says it will be tonight. He can't have her. I'll show him. I grabbed up the date book and left in a hurry. I found Lynn Richards in the tea room across from Granger's. Her eyes looked through me. Oh, oh, Mr. Regan. Mind if I sit down? No, I don't mind. You, um, you know about him? Yes, I know. Mind, um, answering a couple of questions? What's the use, Mr. Regan? What difference does it make? Well, it could make a lot. He's dead, isn't he? He had to do it. Jimmy had to lose his head to go out there. I warned him, Mr. Regan. I told him not to listen to Granger. Well, then, why did Benson go out there last night? I don't know. He told me he had a date with you. I had to cancel it. Granger insisted we finish some correspondence. When was that? Uh, Granger called me around, around 7. He said we had to get the work done, and I couldn't refuse. Uh, your job... Jimmy's job. Oh, don't you see, Mr. Regan? If I'd refused Mr. Granger, he'd have taken it out on Jimmy. But you couldn't make Jimmy see that, huh? I was wrong. I was terribly wrong. I see that now. No job is that important. Tell me about last night. You went out to Granger's at seven. What then? Well, we had dinner. Mr. Granger was in a good humor. He laughed about Jimmy and his jealousy. I suppose I even laughed, too. Then you went to work, no, no, we didn't work. What? Well, that's the odd part of it. You see, we finished dinner around 8.30, and then, just before 9, he told me to go home. What did he say when he told you to go home? Well, it was very odd. He said, well, it has been a charming evening. Much too charming for work. That all? He said he wouldn't need me after all. That what he had in mind, he could set up himself. Set up? Yes, those are the words he used. Set up? Set what up? Mr. Regan, have you uncovered something? You know, sometimes there's a thin line between self-defense and murder. My job is to find that line. What made Granger certain he could outshoot James Benson? It had to be planned, to be set up, as Granger himself put it. But how? I drove down to the office of my boss, the lion. But if I thought he had any ideas about murder, I was wrong. Jeffrey, well, well, come in, my boy. I was just closing for the day. Lion, can't you let that tie alone? Oh, oh the necktie? Just retying it for dinner. Lion, I didn't come here to talk about ties. Granger's the man I'm interested in. Yes, Jeffrey, I read about it. Dreadful. You were the first guy to talk to Granger. He told you he was going to kill a man. Yes, but of course I thought... He said it would be self-defense. Now, Lion, did he say anything about how he knew it would be self-defense? No, Jeffrey. He just said he wanted us as witnesses. I think, Lion, he must have told you something about the job. Well, you see, he handed me this tie and... Oh, by the way, did you know I cut myself shaving this morning because of my new tie? What? It's a fact, Jeffrey. I was shaving when the mirror door to the medicine cabinet swung open and it showed my new tie lying on the bed and I was hey, watching Lion, it. Lion, that's it. Uh, what's what? Did I say something? You said plenty. I'll see you later, General. Jeffrey, what is it? What did I say? Not much, Lion. Just the solution for a murder. Thirty minutes later, I pulled up in front of Granger's place. Dark, silent, lonely looking. The house, a huge gray shape against the expensive shrubbery. I moved slowly up the gravel driveway. Up to the house and the room. To the French doors where a hot-headed guy, crazy with jealousy, had gone to his death. Five minutes later, I had the door open and was inside... Quickly, I moved into the big library. Circled around the heavy furniture, the drapes, the big desk. My hand felt for a light switch and found it. The desk lamp threw a shaft of light down on the desk chair. 
That was the first step. Next, the mirrored doors. I went over to them, swinging them in and out, finding just the right angles, always keeping in mind the desk chair with the light on it. And then I had it. A method for murder. Who's in here? I turned off the desk light and moved away. I heard his big frame move toward the overhead light switch. I wouldn't turn them on if I were you, Granger. Regan. The lights might make you an easy mark. Regan, what do you want in my house? I found it, what I wanted. You were paid off. Now get out. That's the way you figured it, wasn't it, Granger? Enough money will buy anything, even a self-defense plea or a murder. I've got a gun, Regan. And i got evidence. A neat arrangement of mirrors. You put a light on yourself at the desk and arrange the door mirrors. You explain the mirrors as vanity. And that even checked with what I knew about you. Only this time... You put him to use. You can't prove that. Benson came running in here and fired at mirrors, just like you knew he would. You sat back in your desk chair, knowing where he'd fire and let him shoot. And then you killed him. You're lying. No, no, I'm not lying. No, Benson had a date with Lynn Richards. And at the last minute, you made her come out here to work. She told Benson that, tried to explain, but to really set him off, you phoned him too. Told him you had Lynn out here at the house. Megan, you're making it up. You're trying uh-uh, to... Uh-uh, uh-uh. Benson kept a diary. Yesterday's entry said, he says it will be tonight. The he is you, Granger. You phoned Benson, made sure he'd show up angry, jealous. You even locked every door to the place except the one to your study. Part of the staging, the, the setup you told Lynn Richards you'd arrange. Regan, I'm coming for you. I felt his movement across the room before I saw him. The dark shadows moving along the wall. The occasional creak of shoe leather or the faint brush of trousers against chair. He was moving in, and he had a gun, and I had a gun. And it was dark. I got an idea. I slipped gently along the wall, judging it carefully, guessing, hoping for the right spot. And then I flipped on the lights. There you are! Uh, Try again, Granger. Regan! Where are you? I see you! Uh, Your own trick, Granger. A scared guy shoots at mirrors and is left with an empty gun. Uh, Regan! You can call this one Uh, self-defense! Maybe the warden will loan you a mirror, Granger. So you can watch when they strap you in the chair. So, Kirk Granger got a free ride in a police car. And the Lord Granger chain of English-type men's stores could start looking for a new owner. It was after lunch the next day when I checked in with my boss, the lion. There was the lion, not only in his brand new tie, but complete with brand new double-breasted navy blue pinstripe drape-shaped suit. Good afternoon, Jeffrey. Lion, you did it. You what, Jay? I did what? You bought a new suit, General, and on you, it looks great. Well, after all, Jeffrey, we did make a big fee on this case, and uh, our client, Mr. Granger, was so well-dressed. And as head of the Lion Detective Bureau, it's your duty to look good for the company. Uh, Yes, Jeffrey, that's exactly it. It is my duty to look prosperous, to uphold the dignity. And, of course, uh, Eddie will be glad to see it, too. Yeah. Eddie? You know, Eddie, down at the drugstore? Yeah. Let's see, um, you owe him about $12, isn't it? Cigars, remember? And uh, then there's Joe. Yeah, Joe? At the newsstand on the corner. Let me see, you uh, borrowed 10 from him last week. Hey, he'll be glad to see you looking prosperous. Yeah, Jeffrey, you know... Oh, yeah, uh, and then there's Mr. Johnson. He's the landlord. Yeah, I saw him out in the hall a minute ago. Yeah, that uh, must be what he meant. Jeffrey, what are you talking about? What did he say? Well, he told me things must be looking up with the agency. Said something about raising the office rent. Jeffrey, quick, the closet! Too late to hide. Who wants to hide? Get me my old suit! Jeff Regan, Investigator, is written by William Frug and Gilbert Thomas, directed by Sterling Tracy, and stars Frank Graham as Regan, with Frank Nelson as Anthony J. Lyon. Original music is by Dick Arant. Join us next week for another transcribed adventure with Jeff Regan, Investigator, over CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.